First of all, welcome. Welcome to the uh, to the Science Park. Um, a few hellos and welcomes and some uh, sort of housekeeping from me. Uh, I'm Les Ashton-Smith. I'm the uh, Managing Director of uh, EVA Limited. Uh, we're an electronic uh, design company based in Strailed. Um, we got involved with the Raspberry Pi purely from some of my engineers telling me about this um, thing that was arriving, placing orders with uh, RS and Farnell, waiting forever and eventually getting some. Um, and also because uh, we design real-time peripherals. So therefore the two came together. Sorry. That's better. You have to shout at me in, uh, in terms of doing it. Right, let me do some, uh, some housekeeping. Uh, we have no fire alarm put. So if you hear lots of noises and shouts and fire, fire, run through the doors or follow me because I shall be ahead of you. Um, the second one is the facilities uh, for the gents behind this area here. There's a row of unisex uh, uh, toilets and just down here is the, the ladies uh, in terms of doing that. Okay, some, uh, some thank yous. First of all to Richard uh, uh, in behalf of the Bristol and Bath Science Park. As you, uh, I'm sure you're aware, it's a great facility here and obviously very kindly allowed us to, uh, to hold the jam here. Um, Sisemia, who are very kindly sponsoring tonight's refreshments. So uh, thank you very much. Where are they? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, obviously from ourselves, because we're here from doing something. Um, thank you very much to, uh, to Friska, who has stayed on especially tonight to provide us our refreshments. Um, obviously, and I've also been told to remind everyone they actually have some beers and wine from uh, Bath Ales, so good stuff as well. So uh, you know, please uh, enjoy that responsibly and safely as we should do in terms of doing it. Right, okay. We have, uh, we have at least three speakers tonight, and we may well have a four. Um, and I'd like to introduce the first speaker, who is Chris, who's going to talk about uh, the talking boat. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thanks very much. Current work is Genesis. Reading is off. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the project that I'm working on at the moment, which is to um, uh, enable my uh, boat to um, be able to vocalize information about uh, its status and progress. Um, and uh, so, to, so to do that, just so that I don't forget what I want to say. I've, um, I've turned the, uh, the application into, a, into an interviewer, so hopefully... <laughs> Current walk is Genesis. Next walk is interview. Good evening, Chris. Nice to meet you. So, what is your Raspberry Pi project? Uh, well, it's this... Um, um, <laughs> it's a project based um, on a Raspberry Pi using a GPS and a few other instruments uh, to provide um, location and other data available to um, uh, the, uh, the helm in the, on the boat. Good evening, Chris. Nice to meet you. So, what is your Raspberry Pi project? That sounds very cool. So, what made you think of this application? Um, well, as a, as a sailor, um, uh, I've experienced several situations where uh, um, it's very inconvenient to be able to go down below um, and look at screens. Um, you know, picture for yourself somebody on a boat crossing the Bay of Biscay in bad weather at night. Um, it's raining. Um, you trod on your glasses earlier. Um, there's a ship bearing down on you and you're not quite sure whether it's going one side or the other. Um, the forecast was a bit dodgy and you're not quite sure whether that cloud in the distance is some approaching really bad weather. Um, of course, we have um, on the boat, we have various sources of in information that uh, supply this, uh, you know, can help you. But um, if you're in a cockpit, your mate's down below asleep and you don't want to disturb her, um, getting this information both on demand and repetitively is something which is uh, you know, quite tricky, quite difficult. Um. Good evening, Chris. Nice Sorry. to meet you. So, what is your Raspberry Pi project? 
Good evening, Chris. Nice to meet you. So, what is your Raspberry Pi project? That sounds very cool. So, what made you think of this application? Are there any other uses? Um, well, I was thinking about um, Felix Baumgarten last night as he descended, and, and obviously, you know, he doesn't, he's visually impaired and, and sort of handicapped as he drops through the sky, and how he gets information about his progress. Um, um, it, obviously, the, the voice is a, is, a, is a major input source, and in many situations where you're outdoors doing things, um, last year we were sea kayaking, um, in the San Juan Islands near, near Seattle, um, uh, for which I did the sort of basic nav. And when you're sea kayaking, you, you really need to know where you are, especially since it's foggy. You need to know how fast you're going. You need to know about the currents and the state of currents. So in that situation too, there's lots, you need that kind of instant information available in a form where you could, you're not having to look at screens. In, in many situations like that, we're all visually impaired. We can't, can't use screens, and, we're, and we're, we're, we're handicapped, too, in the sense that we can't use keyboards. So, so devices that actually use minimal input and, and minimal um, uh, and audio output, I think, have a, great, have a great future. So, obviously you have a Raspberry Pi, and I guess you are writing in Python, but what else are you using? Uh, well, we're using a, a GPS um, input uh, uh, device, um, which sadly is not working here at all, um, thanks to the building. Uh, it's a wonderfully uh, electrically uh, shielded building. Um, we also have a, I also have a, a barometer. I need the barometer because I want to capture um, and be able to forecast locally without, you know, if you're at sea, you don't have access to, to uh, the, B, the BBC, the Met Office. Um, so we need to be able to um, create our own weather forecasts based on heuristics, typically on heuristics based on uh, the barometric pressure and trends. Um, and we also have a compass because we need to know which way, when you're walking or wh what the boat is doing, you need to know where things are relative to where you're looking. Um, so all of those three devices are, are currently on board. It is a pity that the speak generated sounds are a bit mechanical and the sound is rather noisy. Well, actually, I think uh, uh, this is just eSpeak, which is a standard Unix package for, for um, speech synthesis. And I think it's actually doing an amazingly good job. There's quite a range of voices to use. Uh, this is um, the Midlands accent. Uh, oh, no, hang on. It's North, English North, uh, which I thought was quite sort of friendly. Um, it's noisy because the, um, the ELSA module on the Pi is, is pretty poor. Um, we don't have another talker going, but once you get multiple talkers, um, I'm not single streaming the speech at the moment, and you get clashes, um, and they don't merge, they just mash, mash each other up. And you can also hear clicks at the beginning and ends. So uh, a, better, a better ELSA driver would be a great addition. I don't know, this is very un... Um, modified board this. It's a straight uh, version 1 board with the version 1 software. I'm, I'm scared of doing upgrades and things. What is ELSA? Um, well, it's the name of the, of the, of the module that does um, sound generation. What are you using for sound? Are you coming out of the analog? Yeah, yeah, it's coming out of the analog. It's, it's the analog. It comes out better if it's coming out of the um, HDMI. Well, I've got but, these um, little 89p USB interfaces from the that Oh, okay, right, yeah. I'm a bit short of USB ports on this, but because uh, I'm using two of them at the moment. Um, so, you seem very keen on using speech as output. Could it be useful in the classroom? Um, I think actually speech is kind of useful for, for, for a number of purposes. Um, I don't know, you, you probably remember writing a program in the past that generated random poetry based on a synthesized grammar. Um, and we always like, you know, you like the kids, we like putting sort of rude words into the grammar and, and getting it to, to, to make rude po poetry. I mean, how much ruder is it when you've got a machine that's actually uh, voicing it? Um, so it's kind of fun like that. But also, um, there are small um, sort of algorithmic challenges here um, that you don't have when you're doing visual display. So if you want to display a time, um, on a screen, well, you put it out, 
you know, hours, minutes, and seconds. No problem. Nobody thinks about it. But if you want to vocalize that, there are at least eight, maybe seven or eight different formats in which we typically vocalize a, set, a, a, a time. So making it, um, it's, it's nice little algorithmic work to, um, to write talkers um, that, and, and, and creating um, meaningful sentences um, in situ is a kind of interesting challenge. So I think, um, and it's very simple, just using eSpeak, you just output a sentence to eSpeak and it, then it does the rest. So it's a nice little thing to use in schools, I think, as a, as a simple programming exercise. You say you are using RF PowerPoint presenter for input. How does that work? Uh, well, I didn't actually, but um, <laughs> the, um, for, for, uh, again, for minimal input, I'm using a, um, a PowerPoint presenter, a lab tech um, presenter. A presenter is really just a minimal keyboard. Uh, it needs uh, sort of a bit of a bit of processing on the way in because it's a strange set of keys that it presses. So this has just got four keys, which I've mapped into cursor keys up, down, left, and right. And to control the device, I've got a menu menuing system that will walk according to the key presses here. Um, um, but it's a bit flaky on at the moment because it uh, is uh, an RF device and it's. Uh, uh, it's an, you know, we're, we're lacking power here, so it, it, uh, it flakes out, unfortunately. So, you use a couple of hardware C devices. Are they easy to integrate? Uh, well, I'm not a hardware person at all, really. Um, and I found these surprisingly easy to, 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 to handle. With the, with, I'm using the Adafruit um, I to C, I squared C um, Python package, and that's worked fine. I've had to write a driver uh, you know, that uses that and modify another, but it's, uh, and the wiring is very straightforward. So they're lovely, lovely devices to integrate. You have a lot of separate processes running. How do they communicate? Um, I mean, uh, uh, inter-process communication is always the big problem here, and, and I've gone for something extremely simple. Every one of these processes, and there are eight or nine processes running here, separately monitoring the GPS, the barometer, the compass. All of these are just separate Unix processes, um, saving their state in pickled, as, as uh, pickled files, named files. So there's 20 named, 20 or 30 named objects here, which are being read when required. And it makes it quite resilient, because processes can break and uh, and um, not be, uh, be restarted. You've got, and, and also we can produce testing easily, because we can just write the, the objects plainly. So it's dead easy. So how would this be used on your boat? Is there any information online about the project? Well, thank you, Chris. That's the most interesting. <laughs> uh, well, well, we'd certainly um, plan to put more information into here. One of the things I'd really like to do is we have a um, an, uh, uh, an automatic identification system receiver. This is information generated by boats over VHF to say where they are, where they're going. Um, we get that displayed on a chart plotter, but, but we don't manage to do collision avoidance. Um, we can do that collision avoidance now um, on the Pi, I hope. By, by reading the AIS information, we can work out closest approaches and all that sort of stuff. So having a processor gives it, makes, makes us much less committed to how the manufacturers have decided to process this information. It's, sort of, it's also cheapness. We're, we're very mean as, 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 uh, as, uh, as boaters. Um, and uh, marine equipment is extremely expensive. Um, and every device you get seems to come with its own screen. Of course, you could have all this on a screen in the cockpit, but it would cost you another thousand pounds, and um, uh, you know all that sort of stuff. And it would do exactly what it wanted to do, not what you want to do. Um, so um, there is information on the web. I've been blogging about it, and the code is all in GitHub. Um, so if you go to kitwallace.co.uk, you can follow it from there. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much, thank you very much uh, Chris. Uh, right, okay, that, I think, thank you very much. Let me present our second uh, speaker. Uh, Peter has very kindly stepped in to, uh, he was going to demonstrate, but he's very kindly taken the, the, uh, the challenge and going to present as well. So uh, 
a special uh, welcome to Peter, who's going to talk about charms. We need some time now because we need another lead. Oh, okay, right, okay, we need, need to fill in time. I can't dance, so uh, like the last Raspberry Pi, we had some um, people who filled in some uh, sort of feedback forms for us. Um, can I ask if any of these people are here tonight? Martin Taylor. Oh, Martin, right, come here. Come on, Nigel, you're going to be my... Uh, you are the lucky owner of a uh, Raspberry Pi t-shirt. Ooh. They're all the same, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, any colour you like, as long as it's black or white. Right, Simon Vass. Do we have a Simon Vass? That's mine, then. George Coleman. Might be, you There's might be, that's very exclusive, that t-shirt, it's becoming more and more exclusive. Uh, a Clive Barker. Uh, a Binod Vista. They enjoyed it so much the first time, they didn't come back. Uh, Chris Chapman. Oh, we're doing well here. Um, I have just a Nick. Nick, or... Um, Anyone called Nick? Wasn't the, here last time. Yeah, I say, a lovely, a lovely email address, is that? Slimy.org? Yeah. <laughs> it's a great email address. Uh, and we have a, an Ian Brooks. The Brooks Org.uk? <coughs> nope, not doing that. Okay. We definitely haven't got a Nick here. <laughs> <laughs> or a Chris. Anyone, Anyone like Chris? to volunteer to be a Nick or Chris for the evening? Oh, we've got a Nick here. Nick here is volunteer. Well done, Nick. Have a... <laughs> Anyone want to change their name by default? Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. It's kind of white to black. Well done. Thank you. Uh, I have another one. There's, uh, as if anybody came to the first presentation, um, Heber uh, designed a USB peripheral called the X10i. Um, and I've uh, given uh, a couple of X10i's to the University of Worcester and the um, school's computers in schools campaign, uh, but I have another one here tonight um, which I'm uh, willing to give away to anybody who comes up with a great idea, an application for a Raspberry Pi and a real-time control board. So it's sitting here waiting. This man here is walking around with a pile of yellow post-it notes. So if you collar him, this is Nigel, my uh, able assistant here. So if you collar him with a great idea, you can see he's already collecting them. So there is, what, wouldn't you just want one of those? It just looks so good, doesn't it? It's for free, up for grabs. Basically, we're looking for somebody who comes up with an interesting idea for a real-time control system with their Raspberry Pi. Uh, we won't ask you to design it there and then bring it along, or we might do. Um, but therefore, just let us know. Let Nigel know. Um, let him put in one of his post-it notes and uh, totally randomly we'll pull one out of the hat and uh, offer it either uh, get it, get, the, get it through to you. Right, how are we doing, Peter? I think we're a bit stymied at the moment because we? we can't get anything on the display. So. Oh, gosh. If somebody else would like to go first or... Right, OK. <coughs> what I need is a speech interface. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. It, would, it would be good. Right, yeah. There's nothing like good organisation. This is nothing like... Okay. I think Phil's waiting for his keyboard. Are you still waiting, Phil, for your keyboard? Ah, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to go for it? Okay, right. I can present, therefore, our next speaker who's volunteered at uh, short notice minus keyboard. Now, here's the next challenge. I also have to try and work out how to get it. So. Right. I can call out the command and put it in the config text. <laughs> but if you can't, oh, you're right. <laughs> Can I do a stroll poll for the evening? Who actually now has a Raspberry Pi? How are we, how are we doing? Oh, that's getting, getting better. Getting better. Who's actually ordered one and still waiting? Are they actually coming through now? Yes? <laughs> yes, well, I was also talking to a, a, another uh, attendee about the, the news this morning that... Uh, um, they've changed the, uh, the memory on the uh, Raspberry Pi, which is uh, 
kind of predictable, I guess, but uh, obviously uh, disappointing to someone who's already just bought one recently. Is everyone aware of that? That the uh, I think it was it was this morning announcement that it's actually gone up to uh, five twelve now. The memory. Let's say when is that sort of stuff? It, it's now. As in all stocks, all there. If you haven't turned up yet, you'll get a five twelve May. But that runs the month. So all starts eight weeks ago in China had a five twelve week. They sent the wrong parts. <laughs> <laughs> It's, my guess is that they can't get hold of 256 meg anymore. So, Nigel? 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 My guess is they can't get hold of the 256 meg part anymore. So, what they've done is bought the 512 for the same price and are fitting those instead because the price of the product hasn't changed. Unfortunately, for those of us that have already got them, we're probably not going to be compatible with. It was a little unclear where, where in the supply chain the transition is. Yes, I agree. But it was announced this morning for anybody that didn't see it. And they're all made in the UK now as well. Did everyone know that? Sony? Sony in what's the Bridge, end. Bridge End. So it's a UK product. So it was the arms designed in Cambridge. It was a Sony factory that didn't have many TVs to make. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd rather be built in the UK though. But, uh, They're quite welcome to throw any more questions around if you like. And I'll give it a go at answering them. No, nobody wants to know anything. <laughs> you know it all. Does, does anyone know when the Kirkport's going to be shipping? Are we on? Yep. I'm just asking if anyone knows when the Kirkport's shipping. Well, I put my order in for the GERT board probably three months ago, and when I put it in, they, they said um, it would be Christmas, but I had an acknowledgement this morning from Farnell that it's been dispatched. Oh, right, because I put an order in yesterday. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. So if you've got one on order, it'll probably turn up soon. Of course, you'll have to pay for it now as well. That's the only trouble. <laughs> Anybody that doesn't know what the GERT board is, it's um, a general purpose I.O. board. Was it 30 quid? I can't remember. I think it was probably about that. I've got a feeling it was a little bit more than the pie was, which is a bit odd. Uh, hey -ho. And I guess it'll end up where my pie did initially, which is on the shelf thinking, what am I going to do with it? How am I going to plug it in? What am I going to control with that? Got to make it first, haven't you? Ah, yes. This is the other problem. With the GERT board, it is self-assembly and there are some advantages with um, producing a board which is self-assembly you don't have to put it through certain testing um, there are some big disadvantages to those who don't know how to use a soldering iron because some of the components are surface mount components and if you're not very good at soldering what am i looking at without my glasses yeah um, yeah, so if you're not very good at soldering and you've got a surface mount component to put on a board, you're going to probably need some help. Or you'll be doing what happened back in the 80s where Sinclairs were sending out kits of things and people made them and they didn't work and they sent them back. And my guess is... Well, probably... Yeah, great. I'm sure, I'm sure that I, mean, I know of at least one person that's quite capable of bringing his equipment here to do that, if that's a service that people want. Yeah, they can do that. Another question behind you. Can I just uh, let everybody know, Bristol Hackspace, uh, we're down in Bedminster, we've got people there who can solder, we've got uh, a stereo microscope, we ran a surface mount soldering workshop a few weeks ago, so if there's interest in people who would like to learn how to surface mount solder, Please get in touch, Bristol Hackspace. Uh, we'll be only too pleased to show you how to do surface mount soldering. There you go, thank you. Uh, there's two offers already. <laughs> do you, does everybody understand the difference between surface mount and through hole soldering? Um, anybody that's used Vera board, you get um, a resistor, for instance, that's got two legs. You put one leg through the hole of the PCB and solder it from the underside. Surface mount's different. 
you place it on and solder it onto the same side as you've placed it. And you usually overheat the component and kill it before you've got it attached. So good luck with your GERT boards, but there is another board, which I was trying to remember the name of earlier, um, which is very similar to the GERT board, and that's just about to be released as well, much smaller, and it's already assembled, so you don't have to worry about that. Is that a quick wire? Sorry? Is that a quick to wire? Uh, sorry, oh yeah, I was asked if that was the quick to wire board, and uh, I know of that board, but no, it wasn't. It wasn't that board. Um, has anyone got Google? Can you Google uh, Raspberry Pi RS485? And we'll have a, an answer shortly. Huh? Certain. There's still lots going on back here. Anybody else got any questions? I'm doing quite well so far. I've been able to answer them. Come on, give me a really awkward one that I can't answer. That's it. Rasp Pi Com. Has it got price? It's about thirty pounds, I think, and it's about the same size as the Raspberry Pi, so it just fits neatly down on top of the, um, the original board. So, asking around earlier, what people were interested in, there do seem to be a lot of people interested in education and what they're students can do with it. There's a lot of educationalists here in the room and hopefully they can network. There's one here, it's got a t-shirt on it, says it on it as well. So. Uh, I'm here um, nominally um, nominally um, representing uh, computing at schools. Um, I'm from the... Is that where? Yeah. Um, I'm from the Chase School in Malvern uh, and I um, run the uh, CAS hub for Herefordshire, uh, Worcestershire and Gloucestershire. Have we got anyone from a uh, Gloucestershire school here? I was expecting a couple. Well. <laughs> We're in South Gloucestershire. Okay, anyone representing a school or a college in the, in the area then? Wiltshire. Wiltshire, okay, so you'll know Clare then, will you? Okay. Um, just to, I'll talk I a little bit. I think they're bit. all really shy because there are more people there. Than oh, okay. Well, if you, if you do want to talk about um, uh, Raspberry Pis, um, computing at schools, uh, what, what your school in particular is doing or would like to do, or in fact any aspect of uh, what computing at schools are doing, then uh, I'll be here for a bit, so come and talk to me um, about that. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, the Computing at School group is a group that's... Uh, really just set itself up, um, you know, with a bit of, F, um, well, what do we say, bit of vim and vigour um, in the last year or so. Um, and our um, goal, if you like, is to uh, put the excitement um, back into computing in schools. Um, for so long, um, computing hasn't been available for um, students of a certain age. And uh, we're really quite excited, and hopefully you are too, because now it's starting to be. And things like, the uh, reason I'm here tonight is uh, not only am I very interested in the Raspberry Pi, but obviously very interested in what it can do for our students um, in terms of their learning. Now, um, basically, if we can provide a 20 pound, uh, 20 pound device that we can install Debian, um, Scratch, and Python on, then that's all the students need um, for GCSE computing. And we feel that um, it's through offering um, a curriculum such as GCSE computing um, that we'll get more people applying for jobs at your places. So, um, like I say, if you want to come and talk to me about that, is everything working now? Yes. It is. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you very much for that. Okay, come and talk to me. Did you hear that, everybody over there? Who won't admit to being in anything to do with education. Um, <laughs> Arthur, hi, how are you? Good, you're going to do the next talk, I believe. Uh, yes. Yes, so you'll need one of these. Arthur came last time and spoke about a robotic arm, voice control robotic arm, and this time we're going to talk about... I'll show you in a bit. You're going to show us, I think it might be something to do with a lamp looking at the table. So thank you very much. Thanks, Arthur.
Hello? Hello. Okay. Um, so, hi everyone. Um, I'm back. <laughs> it's been just slightly over a year ago that I actually first uploaded my, vid my first video about the robotic arm with voice control. Uh, and that was because uh, through a silly accident, I managed to get my arm in a cast. And building a robotic arm seemed a sensible idea. <laughs> and then uh, I followed that up with uh, working with a charity called Remap. And working with them, it became obvious that you know there was a there was a need for some low cost, uh, customized you know voice recognition technology. Um, so once I got my first Raspberry Pi in May, I immediately um, got it working with my robotic arm, and I uploaded the video as well, uh, which you know uh, showed that it didn't work very well, but it you know it sort of worked. Uh, it made it to the Raspberry Pi homepage, um, but with the USB issues, uh, I actually took a short break to uh, build a robotic car. So it was quite a fun project. Um, and finally, uh, I want to show you my current project, which is Luxopi. <clears throat> So Luxo Pi, well, it's named after Luxo, the lamp in the Pixar, uh, Pixar's first short film. Um, it's a voice control desk lamp. So I used the Raspberry Pi's uh, GPIO pins for the first, I was new to it, uh, to control a mains relay. So I did this so that I could, you know, try to explore the practicality of voice control using the Raspberry Pi. I wanted to see what issues I would encounter in terms of convenience, in terms of, say, health and safety, and just to try to make it as convenient as possible for, you know, actual applications. So there's a photo of Luxo Pi, and um, the, the nice thing about Luxo Pi is that it's, if I disconnect the Raspberry Pi, it's just a normal lamp. Um, so I'm going to show you a demonstration now of the, the lamp, and given that, you know, uh, it's a demonstration, it's probably not going to work, but let me give you a go. <laughs> Sorry. So here I've you know taken some measures that I don't have to um, use Wi-Fi to connect a Raspberry Pi or anything, so that uh, I'll you know it's very easy to set up. So hopefully it will work. So I'm just waiting for the Raspberry Pi to start up. So I'm using a PlayStation lamp to, uh, sorry, PlayStation Eye as a microphone because you know it's, I got it for four quid at the store and it's, um, it's a good camera and it's also a microphone. Okay. Okay. Um, that activated accidentally. Let me try it again. Thank you. 
live demos. Yeah. <laughs> live demos. <laughs> Risky. You can tell us what it's supposed to do. <laughs> okay, well, what it's supposed to turn on when I say, um, when I ask it to turn on, really. Light on. Light on. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Light on. Light on. Actually, uh, you know, this acoustic model, I'm still working to refine it. Um, you know, it, it took that long to turn it on. Um, actually, it doesn't like getting told to turn off yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm working to improve it, so uh, hopefully next time, you know, uh, there will be lots and lots of applications for this technology. But anyway, uh, you know, the Raspberry Pi is really an excellent piece of work, and it's still improving. So, uh, the, you know, the firmware update on September 18 actually enabled me to get this uh, voice recognition uh, to an acceptable level. Uh, so, you know, uh, that it fixes the USB audio. And today, we just got the news that we got twice as much RAM. So, uh, I'll be continuing to work on, you know, these interesting projects and posting on my blog about it. And hopefully I can, you know, inspire some of you to uh, start nice projects as well, you know. Uh, because technolo technology like this, like uh, voice recognition and um, autonomous cars, uh, shouldn't be limited to large companies like Google or Apple. So let's try to unleash, you know, all this untapped innovation in the UK. Thank you, thank you very much, Arthur. We're, we're all, we all get caught sometime by the uh, live demonstration. Right, okay. Um, just as I just said, in terms of um, Peter, we have some problems with um, the charm demonstration. Uh, Peter's actually going to set up in the demo room, which we've got over next door, um, which I know is working there. So uh, when we get a chance after the, uh, the last speaker, we can go over there and have a look. Uh, there's also, um, uh, we've got our uh, X10i running in there. And I know there's a couple of others around here on some of the tables. Obviously, one of the things about the Raspberry Jam is, is to do just that, is to actually network with other people, talk to them, find out what they're doing, um, obviously help in a you know, constructive way, looking at ways that you can uh, offer your assistance or ideas. Um, and that's what's so exciting about this particular project, um, the fact that you're here this evening um, and looking at uh, people who've obviously do a lot of this in their own time, um, in those sort of uh, snatched hours of evenings or in the middle of the night. So uh, well done to everyone who's, uh, who's working through and getting uh, more and more exciting things with the, uh, with the Raspberry Pi. I was just going to mention um, Patrick's brought his cases again for anybody that wanted a case for your Pi, and they'll be in the demonstration room. And at a request of my own, he actually built me a really special one, a wood, because I'm very green and I like brass as well. Um, and you can get, he actually made some for everybody else as well, so you can get them in there. Um, and there's also, over here, we've got somebody with a home, I'm not sure how he described it now. It, I think it's a home automation system. Is that right? Home control? Eventually. Eventually. Yeah. Yeah, at the moment, it's flashing some LEDs. So anybody that's got LEDs in their home, that'll uh, work nicely. <laughs> We've all got LEDs in our home, haven't we? So, have we got any more questions for me? Yes, we've got a question. And we need a mic, Les. Thank you. More questions. Thank you. Initially, it's just a comment. Building the Pi case, an essential is actually a rubber band. You need three hands 
for the inexperienced hands to put together. Now, I was growing up, I played with Meccano, so I was pretty dexterous all the way through, but an elastic band was a great help. But my question is this, you have a pie, once it starts up and you get your web page up, and you see a pie, a Raspberry Pi page, and it scrolls down and it says, see this video. Of course you can't. You've got to add more software before you can do it. Now what I need is an absolutely foolproof, idiot-proof guide to doing everything you need to do that. And I can't find one. I go onto the forum and I find this little bit. Get to the interesting part, bit, and the forum questions all stop at that point. Or there's a jump to something else and there's a gap in between that my knowledge doesn't fill. I need some absolutely foolproof now, one of them I came across, which is foolproof, it started off by saying, do this, this. Oh, if that didn't work, you obviously haven't got your, um, what's the name, Link? Um, what do I mean? The wireless link? Well, not, not the wireless link. The, the connection to bring your, my mind's got an absolute blank. That's <laughs> Internet? Happened to, Traditional, you put a microphone in someone's hand and the mind goes blank. <laughs> yes. But that's the general theme. Thank you very much. Okay. If there's anybody here that can actually answer that question, they... Yes, we have got somebody who can answer that question. I think it's... The... He hasn't got codex installed on his machine for that video. No. Um, is it on? Yeah. No, just to answer your question... Hold I'm... it nice and close. I completely agree with you that four forums forums tend to dive off and complain about, oh, it doesn't run quite as quick, or it goes into details that you don't care about. Um, I discovered a publication called Magpie. Uh, it's at www.themagpie.com. I've got one here. And that is exactly what you need. That starts at the basics. I remember 25, 30 years ago reading a similar thing for a BBC Micro. It brought back a lot of memories. And that's exactly what you need. So don't go to the forum because they'll just put you off. That's my answer. Thank you very much. Does everybody know about Magpie? I'll just grab hold of that one in a second. I'm not sure if everybody's seen this. It's really... Oh, sorry. Damaged it already. It's really akin to the magazines of the 80s, which BBC Micro was one, Sinclair User. Uh, I think there were rather a lot, actually, of magazines around that. And they're a really good starting point for children because... I can remember typing in programs out of these magazines when I was a teenager, and that got me into programming, so I definitely recommend that, that book. It's got, I think it's even got a section in there for programming, hasn't it? Uh, yeah. Yes. And, and they're all available online for free. Yeah. Um, yeah. We should have some that were donated to the Bristol Raspberry Jam here this evening, but Trevor, who received them, forgot to bring them with him. But he's gone home to get them, so if anyone wants to have a look, I guess there's one there, and there may be a couple more here later as well. Okay. Yeah, uh, if anybody's got any questions about Arthur's demonstration, please shout. I think it does. Sorry, let me get that question again so everyone else can hear. I just wondered if he overclocked his CPU to. Um Give you enough pre CPU power to do the voice recognition. Uh, yes, I did uh, do a moderate overclocking of this one, but what actually enabled uh, the USB audio to work correctly was the firmware update that was on September September 18th. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that was a big improvement. I haven't actually added that to my Pi. I don't know if anybody else. Has I think it's quite a simple update as well, isn't it? You don't have to replace a whole SD card. Are we ready to go? Let me just, so, let me take a mic and apologize. Sure. So I'm supposed to be one of the really interesting speakers today, and we're having a major IT disaster. Mm. Cannot get pictures out of my damn Mac onto the projector. One of my SD cards has corrupted itself on route, but my backup system's working okay. So if you give me five, I'll make you some really good squelchy farty noises from my synthesizer. So <laughs> give me five. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? You must have loads. Yeah. Any 
you go. Do we know if there's uh, any facility for the Raspberry Pi to suspend itself to RAM? And is there any way of powering it once it's suspended to RAM? Or uh, maybe even hibernation, um, which isn't going to ruin the SD card's uh, life. But, I, or just any method of basically sending it to a very, very low power state or no power state so that you can bring it back up very, very quickly. I guess that's probably a Linux type question. Did everybody hear those? Is there a way to put it, the Raspberry Pi into a suspended mode, a hibernation mode? Does anybody know that? I don't actually know that. No, there's just no hardware. It just doesn't have the right hardware to do it. No. So the answer is no. I guess it's using very little power anyway. Um, the question or an answer? You could, you could dynamically underclock it to maybe 100 rather than 700. Close, close. You could dynamically uh, underclock it. I saw um, a guy on raspberrypi.org talking about um, power consumption because it's, it's a big complaint because Arduinos are very low powered. Yeah, Raspberry Pi, you know, 700 milliamps is a lot um, to, be, to expect of such a small device. But he, he talked about um, you could underclock it to 100. 100 megahertz, and that should really decrease uh, power usage. The other thing you mentioned was the Model A, which wouldn't have a network um, stack in it at all, would also drop the power a lot. But, and he did say about you could desolder a Model B, but that's a bit risky. <laughs> it might take a little while to bring it back up if you desolder. Anyone else? Sorry? Yes, I don't know any jokes, or I'd tell those while you were waiting. I'd just be interested to know, has anyone actually managed to break the Raspberry Pi yet? Uh, yes, yeah. Arthur's broken his. <laughs> why, why am I not surprised, Arthur? <laughs> Did you mend it afterwards? I believe it's beyond repair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, we have noises. I'll show you pictures, yeah, I can make noises. Noises are good. It seems very audio based actually this evening. <laughs> uh, how I ruined one of my Raspberry Pi was I, uh, I was shorting the F1 and F2 fuses to provide more power to the USB port. And uh, I think one of the times I powered it on, there was a smoky smell and <laughs> that was it but uh, um, for this one you see I've, uh, for my projects you know I've, I just want to say a bit more about this lamp I've disconnected the Raspberry Pi now and it actually acts as a normal lamp um, so you know in case you get tired of it, it doesn't follow you then yeah just use it as a normal lamp I used uh, plenty of Sugru and Polymore to actually isolate the 240 volt leads here, uh, you know, to, to protect anyone from touching them. And I'm also trying to get a Bluetooth microphone to work with a, ras uh, with a Raspberry Pi, which means that I will save one extra wire from, uh, from this setup. And given that, uh, live demonstrations were very tricky. I actually set up the Raspberry Pi to automatically start the speech recognition program upon boot. But to do that, uh, because I didn't have a screen, I actually wired up a small LED that started blinking when the program was running. So it's just some mitigations for uh, technical failures on a demo. This is going to take some gymnastics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's know when you're ready, Phil. I may never be ready. <laughs> but this may be as ready as it gets. Any more questions? Sorry, any more questions? No. Now, I've never tried this. Nice and close. Thank you. So I've never tried this before. Arthur may have saved my life in that we've had to export my keynote presentation to a QuickTime movie 
I have no clue how to progress to the next slide, but um, we'll see what happens. So I'm, I'm Phil, and I'm going to talk to you about my synthesizer, uh, which has a, a cute name, Piano, for all sorts of reasons. As I said, I've never tried this before. We'll get there, bear with me, boys and girls. One more thing that we um, all keep asking each other and don't get very good answers on is, what are you doing with your pie? And one of the things that we'd like to promote here is for you to come along and bring us your projects and set them up out here and show us what you're doing with your pie. And the other one's, what do you want us to do with your pie? Heber, our hardware designers, manufacturers, if there's a project you want, such as RS485, then why not talk to us and see if we can build you that solution. But um, we really do need to know what you want to do with your pies, what you do with your pies, and what you want to see in the future. So if you've got some ideas. Right. Heber's X10i was um, demonstrated at the last Raspberry Pi, and Richard's not hiding. He's, he's going to come and tell you about it now. Hello. Okay, so this is our uh, our USB I/O board. Uh, we developed this uh, actually about 11 years ago. Um, it's uh, been a very successful board for us, used in all sorts of industries, um, and it provides um, a USB simple USB interface um, with to any computer. Actually, it wasn't really designed for the Pi. Um, Nigel here actually did uh, porting of the Linux driver across uh, and got it running on the Pi. Um, a little while ago when we first got to our board. Um, it's, it's really uh, a board designed to, to talk to the outside world, so computers are great for graphics and sound and uh, voice control, <laughs> sort of, uh, and uh, all sorts of other things. Um, but when you actually want to interface to motors and switches and uh, relays and all sorts of things like that, uh, especially the Raspberry Pi, it doesn't have a huge amount of I.O. So uh, many years ago, we, we saw uh, an opportunity to actually have a simple USB connection. And uh, this is one of the most successful boards uh, we, we've developed. It's used in all sorts of industries, uh, a lot of vending machines, and um, uh, all sorts of entertainment machines and um, amusement uh, sections, uh, as well as industrial control. So it's got a real-time processor on, it takes all the headache and all the hassle off of uh, uh, your main computer. Um, and uh, allows you to, uh, to, to send its simple commands over the USB and receive um, messages uh, backwards and forwards, really. So you can control uh, stepper motors, so you could uh, uh, control an industrial piece of machinery with this, or conveyor belts, that sort of thing. Uh, you can read um, uh, digital measurements back, you can talk to all sorts of interfaces, it's got I squared C and uh, SPI um, on it. Um, and it's got a, a built-in audio amplifier as well, which is quite useful um, for some of the uh, uh, sort of machines that uh, gets used in sort of coffee machines, things like that. How are we doing? Are we getting there? <laughs> right, I'll stop waffling now then. <laughs> God, I'm supposed to be good at this. I can't apologize enough. So, um... I'm going to be talking to you about my synthesizer project. Uh, here's what I shall be talking to you about, and I'm not going to just talk to slides so you can read that lot. Uh, and I'll move swiftly on. So, um, 
what is a synthesizer? Allegedly, I got this off Wikipedia, so it's probably absolute nonsense. But a synthesizer claims to be an electronic instrument normally played by a keyboard, producing a wide variety of sounds by generating and combining signals of different frequencies. Uh, here's a few, um, a few synthesizers you may recognize. There's a, the one you won't recognize is the Raspberry Pi at the top left. So come and look on the, on the table later, where it's, uh, it's living. I brought two, by the way, I told you. I brought two and one of my SD cards died, so I'm, I'm very, very upset. So if the other SD card dies during the demo, we'll get no sound. So I just want to walk you through some uh, important, for, for me, important synthesizers in the history of music synthesis. It's a very Phil-centric um, list in that I'm drawing from each of these, to a large extent, drawing from each of these. Uh, on the Raspberry Pi Piano Project. So in 1928, a very, very long time ago, uh, the first recognizable synthesizer, this mic is weird, isn't it? First recognizable synthesizer was built, uh, the Ond Martino. So it was controlled by a keyboard, um, had electronic oscillators made of valves, um, and made ethereal sci-fi noises. So your various, this one's actually, now I've worked out how to hold it, it's great. You just have to pretend to be Gary Barlow. Um, <laughs> which is hard when you're my age. Um, so yeah, the, the On Martino and the Theremin were invented in the same year. The Theremin you've probably seen is the synthesizer which has a proximity detector and requires lots of gestural stuff. Um, the On Martino, so I think he was called Maurice Martino, was actually a cellist and wanted to build a keyboard instrument that had the, um, the playability of a cello, so it could do glissandi, could, could do vibratos. Um, so there's in fact a ribbon controller underneath the keyboard of an Ond Martino. So you can play it with keys and it simply depresses a piece of wire against a contact. Um, that keys in a certain amount of resistance and the oscillator does its magic. Um, I'm probably nerding out here, so tell me off if I am. Uh, the Ond Martino also, as well as having, having a keyboard you could play with, uh, one could grab hold of the piece of wire using a ring and pull and push and make contact physically. So it's a, a remarkable piece of kit. Uh, and 1928, moving swiftly on, I have to include this, because uh, the Mellotron, the first ever sampling, actually the second ever sampling musical instrument, the Chamberlain was the first sampling musical instrument. Um, and the guys at Streetly kind of completely ripped off accidentally the Chamberlain and then made good by, by paying back later. Um, but they, they weren't aware the IP was somewhat lifted. Um, a real sampling musical instrument based on tape heads. So a Mellotron contains 35 tape playback units. As you press a key on a Mellotron, the motor engages against the tape and it physically pulls the tape up against the playback head. So it's, it's really samples of real violins and real cellos, but it contains 35 tape recorders. Absolutely brilliant. And you can buy my Mellotron on the App Store right now, by the way, so go do that. No, no plug, obviously. Here's where things get really, really interesting for me. Uh, 1960s, 1970s, 1964, Bob Moog introduced the, uh, the first Moog modular. 1971, the Mini Moog was introduced. These are the synthesizers that you recognize as synthesizers. So they're entirely electronic, entirely analog, contain oscillators that generate fundamental waveforms like sine waves, triangle waves. Um, Envelope generators that shape the sound over time. So if you want a sound to attack really hard, the envelope generator will have a fast attack time uh, and then potentially a slow decay time to sound like a piano. If you want it to sound like a violin, you'll have a slow attack time and a slow decay. Um, and the filter, so the envelope generators are then modulated in funky ways. I'll describe how I do my modulation later. Um, the idea behind the modulation is that the fundamental waveforms, so sine waves, contain no harmonics. They're an absolutely pure tone. So if you filter a sine wave, you just get a louder or a quieter sine wave as it, as it passes through the, um, through the cutoff. Square waves and triangle waves have harmonics, but the way to get really interesting harmonic content, and content into a signal is to introduce sidebands. And you do that by basically bouncing the signal around in either phase, frequency, or whatever. Um, so that's the process of modulating the signal. The filter then takes this harmonically rich signal and removes parts of the signal and boosts and gains parts of the signal as well. So Mini Moog 71, the first uh, analog synth that you would recognize as a, as a real synthesizer. And then for those of you old enough to remember how appalling pop music was in the 1980s, the reason pop music sounded horrible is because uh, synths went digital. 
So Yamaha introduced the DX7 in 83. So, he, so get this, 83, the, the, the period of time is so short. 83 at NAM, Yamaha introduced the DX7. 1985, Live Aid, Wembley, every single band on stage had a DX7. So uh, that's like everybody in Germany buying a Ford two years after, after a new Fiesta's introduced. It's absolute ubiquity in the market. Uh, because it was that good, I'm, I'm listing it because it's important, not because I used any of its techniques, because they're too hard for me to do. I, in fact, lifted the Casio's phase distortion technique for, for my synth. Um, and also in the 1980s, uh, only in the 1980s could a recording of a barking dog to the tune of how much is that doggy in the window get to number one. Uh, that's entirely the fault of emulators, synclaviers, and fairlights. So uh, sampling took off in the 80s, and music would never be good again. And weirdly, I'm now all nostalgic for the 80s, so I've built a really 80s synth. So you just saw a timeline of synthesizers dating back to 1928. Uh, the timeline of my synthesizer was much shorter in that I literally had a dream in May. This is bizarre. You, you're going to think I'm bonkers, right? But I had a dream of waveforms wobbling around, and I thought, ooh, that, ooh, that would be a good way to, to do a synthesizer. And I genuinely thought I had invented a whole new style of music synthesis. Um, I looked it up, and in fact, Casio had invented it 30 years before, but you know, at least it was a good idea. Somebody had had it before. Um, my target processor was a dual core, one gigahertz ARM Cortex A9. Now, for those of you who don't follow the ARM roadmap, and it's probably like me in the whole room follows the ARM roadmap, uh, the Cortex-A9 is two entire generations after the Raspberry Pi processor. Um, each of the cores, at the same clock, each of the cores in the, uh, the Cortex-A9 are at least twice as fast as the, as the ARM 11 in the Raspberry Pi. So you're looking at something that's between four and five times as fast as the Raspberry Pi was the target machine I wanted to put this synthesizer onto. Which is why it got challenging as we, as we got onto the Raspberry Pi. Um, so my original concept was back to the 80s. Having just been really, really rude about the 1980s, I decided I wanted to build a classically 80s synthesizer, pure phase distortion. Um, it had, in fact, a manifesto. There shall be no filters. Um, and it's great to have a manifesto, but when it sounds rubbish, you really do have to start again. So I started again, ran about June, July, rewrote the guts of it, um, added a very Moog-like filter, uh, and thus was born my first polyphonic virtual analog synth, which was called Pollyanna. Thanks to my wife for naming it Pollyanna. Um, and then my Raspberry Pi arrived in the post. I thought, hang on. This, you know, it's feeble. It's rubbish. It was only $30. Can it possibly run a synthesizer? Let's give it a go. And uh, it didn't take long to get something up and running on it. Oh, I have a sequence. Um, by August, Everything was up and running enough for me to post a couple of videos, and um, Liz very kindly blogged me on the front page of the Raspberry Pi thing. And then my blog went insane for about 12 hours, and now I'm simply forgotten again. But for 12 hours, it was quite brilliant. Um, three classic synthesis techniques inside Piano. By the way, she's called Piano, as I've, as I've said several times. It's such a cute name. My wife again. Um, so virtual analog synthesis. So you remember when I was prattling on about Moogs, having uh, oscillators, envelope generators, and filters. I've actually got digital analogs of these digital analogs of these analog components. So um, pieces of code which oscillate, um, pieces of code which do envelope generation, and pieces of code which do filtering. Um, so it's it's fully digital, but it's virtually virtual analog. It's modeling an analog synth. Uh, and this is what's known in the trade as a subtractive synthesizer. The reason being. Um, Oh, I thought I had a follow-on. Anyway, subtractive synthesis. What that really means is you have a, a harmonically rich waveform, and the filter subtracts, selectively subtracts spectral components from that. Uh, the second of the classic synthesis techniques, phase distortion. So you basically mess about with the phase of the signal, uh, and it becomes much more harmonically complex. And uh, actually, the code, all this is in the code base, and it's based on the application that's in the App Store right now. So the, there's a complete sample-based synthesizer as well going into this thing. Um, sounds great on the Mac, just haven't run it on the Raspberry Pi yet. Sorry, ran out, ran out of time. Trying to sell a house, you know, things get busy. Um, how phase distortion works, there's a video embedded in this, which you're obviously not going to be able to see because this is a PDF. Um, so here's a, here's a pure sine wave. 
during the process of phase distortion, the period of the wave isn't altered. So um, the start point and the end point of this waveform, they start and end at the same place. But conceptually, this is where it gets wacky, time gets squashed early on and stretched later on. So um, on the left, the, the little, for those of you who remember school, y equals mx plus c, uh, the linear phase has a single slope, uh, which is 1.0, that represents time going at its normal speed. The distorted phase has a really high slope on the left and a really shallow slope on the right, and does what the right-hand side tells you it does to the waveform. So you can see the, the midpoint of the wave gets pulled early in time, uh, and the second half of the wave gets, gets stretched. What that does, apart from doing really funky things to the waveform, the fundamental, because the endpoints of the uh, sine wave have not moved, the fundamental doesn't change. So if you play a C-sharp on the piano with tons of phase distortion, it's still recognizably and harmonically a C-sharp. It will fit in with any chord that requires an a C-sharp, like an A. Um, a major, I suppose. Oh, my, my, my music maths head just broke, so I may be wrong on that one. Um, so it's still, you can tell it's still a C-sharp, but there's lots of rich harmonic content going on, so it basically sounds dead groovy, which is really what you want in a synthesizer. You want it to sound dead groovy. Uh, here's the video you can't see, sorry about that, it's simply a, a still. So how I've done all this is much like the talking boat. Actually, the talking boat, when it was described earlier, was using heavyweight Linux processors. Uh, I'm much wimpier, I'm simply using lightweight threads. Um, and I suppose the lightweight threads, are, are, I'm using them for a reason, because I've got lots of these things, they're genuinely active all at the same time. And messages are thrashing around inside the system. So there's a thread that reads MIDI input from a keyboard. There's a thread which I've called the human machine interface. That's really the brains of the synthesizer, but it doesn't do any synthesis. It just does uh, the vast amount of housekeeping required. So it knows what the user interface is doing. It knows what the synthesizers are doing, but it's not doing the user interface and it's not doing the synthesis. The synthesis is being done by a cluster of synthesizer engines, one for the phase distorter, one for the sampler, uh, one for something else when I bring that in later. Um, there's an OpenGL, which is a 3D graphics presentation layer. Its job is to draw the user interface. Um, couple that with a native audio thread. Now, the reason the native audio thread is there, that decouples the synthesizer from the, um, the low-level API that actually delivers sound on the platform. By putting that in place, by, so by decoupling the MIDI input from the HMI, <coughs> decoupling the OpenGLS from everything else, and decoupling the native audio from the synthesizer, it means I can replace a tiny amount of code and run the Raspberry Pi program on a Mac or on a PC or on any other piece of Linux kit or even on a, uh, on a BlackBerry playbook, conceptually. I'm talking to the guys at BlackBerry, but they're just kind of useless. Um, anyway, the less said about that, the better. Um, and they wouldn't give me a job. What can you do? I love them. So here's the really, the really hairbrained, bonkers bit in the middle of all this, the threads. So if we go back to the, go back one picture. Uh, the synthesizer engine thread, the, the piano synthesizer thread, the virtual analog thread, looks like this internally. So for every note that you're holding down on the keyboard, all of this is going on all at the same time. It's, it's a wild amount of stuff is happening. Um, so two oscillators are running, and they're being very carefully alias managed. I won't even begin to explain aliasing, but there's a lot of work to make this, the signal not sound horrid. Um, noise generator, those things are pushing their outputs into a filter, as, as previously discussed. MIDI commands routed from the HMI are telling the oscillator which notes to play, uh, telling the noise generator whether it should play notes or not. In the middle of all this is a modulation matrix. Its job is to command the oscillators to say, change your face distortion, make it more face distorted or less face distorted, um, change your pitch. So if, if you pull on the pitch bend wheel, that turns into some modulation matrix work that tells the oscill oscillators to change their pitch. Um, and the modulation matrix also pushes outputs into the filter to tell the filter how to filter the sound. Four envelope generators, two low frequency oscillators, tons and tons and tons of stuff and not only tons of stuff, but tons of complexity, tons of scope for things to go horribly wrong, and tons of scope for the, a mere human to be incapable of set, getting a sound out of this thing. 
So having built this incredibly rich, complex, wild and crazy synth, um, I just cut the, cut the complexity back massively. So I've gone for um, a very simple templated approach to sounds. So um, I, I did once compute when I had the previous modulation matrix system in place that it would take 10 times the lifetime of the universe to audition all the sounds that this synth could make if you audition them one every three seconds. Uh, and it's probably down to a couple of days now. So I've, I've removed a ton of complexity because we do not have the lifetime of the universe, basically. Um, so that's the software. Hardware. How do you connect a keyboard to a Raspberry Pi? Well, the obvious solution is MIDI. And the only solution is MIDI. Um, most people, I think, would use USB MIDI. Um, I didn't because I couldn't get the code to work. And also, it was, it was slow in performance very badly. Um, and also, if you use USB MIDI on a Raspberry Pi, because it doesn't support the kinds of drivers that you can get on desktop, Windows, and, and Macs, you can't use really cheap MIDI keyboards. And the whole, the whole point of the Raspberry Pi is it's dead cheap, right? So you want to be able to use a $100 keyboard, not a $300 keyboard. I have to have brought a $300 one, but you know. Um, so if you use a, um, a cheap USB MIDI keyboard, uh, it simply won't work with the Raspberry Pi because the MIDI keyboard needs to be class compliant and the cheap ones aren't. So that's why it's nice to, to stick um, five quid's worth of extra hardware onto your Raspberry Pi and put an old fashioned MIDI interface on it, which is what I've done. Uh, and also it's a great exercise in soldering because MIDI is dead easy. It's just a UART running at a strange speed with an optocoupler. Um, just look at Ohm's law, look at Kirchhoff's current law, and you can build it. And here are a couple of what I have built from a tin of mints uh, and a piece of plywood. And I've brought the, uh, the successor to the piece of plywood with me today. And unfortunately, it's the one that the SD card died on. So it may be something to do with it being made out of a piece of plywood. There you go. Um, the thing I'm actually good, because the plywood one died, the thing I'm demonstrating today is my integrated unit, which uh, has got its own little display, so please come, come take a look at it. Uh, it's got what I've called a teeny tiny TV, it cost me all of 15 quid on eBay. It's uh, an NTSC PAL compatible uh, three and a half inch panel. Uh, it's supposed to be driven by 12 volts, but uh, what's the guy, SK Pang. The, if you go to the SK Pang website, there's great instructions on how to take one of these um, displays and hack it so that you can drive it from five volts. And obviously, once you can drive it from five volts, you can drive it straight from a USB connection, which is really, really cool. Uh, so my entire synth is powered simply by a USB plugged in at the back. Um, USB audio interface, all of one pounds 50. You can see I, I absolutely broke the bank on building this synth. Um, Raspberry Pi is what, 25 quid? <coughs> Matrix board for a quid, and then uh, the ADSL router box, it was probably 100 quid, but because it blew up three years ago and I kept the box, I've, I've I counted it as free. Excuse me. Something repeating. I know you don't need to know that, but. Um, and that's what the thing looks like. And it's, it's sitting here right now, and it's going to start making noises. Possibly now. Now, by the way, I cannot play the piano. Can anybody here play the piano? I repeat, can anybody here play the piano? This is going to sound horrible. Okay. So, so that is, that's the simplest sound you can possibly make with a synth. The reason it doesn't sound like a synth, it sounds like a bleepy thing, is because that's a pure, un, I'm having to keep an eye on the screen to see what I'm doing. That's a pure, unmodulated sine wave. If I go to the next preset, so, so it's, it's an unmodulated sine wave. There's nothing happening with the envelope generator. So you hit the key, you get full-scale sine wave, um, and it stays full-scale sine wave until you take your finger off the key. So we'll introduce an envelope generator. And you can hear it's decaying over time. It's a little more piano-like. Bring up the second oscillator, so we've now got a square wave as well. All sounds a bit eight quid in Casio, right? Because nothing, nothing's happening yet. Bear with me. It's the eight quid Casio will get way richer. Um, now move to preset two. I've just punched in five presets on this thing. It's got a deep editing interface, which I can't use because you can only use that over HDMI, and my HDMI system is blown up. Um, so I'm stuck with the shallow editing interface of NTSC. So anyway, preset number two now has a slow attack on the envelope generator. So it's starting to sound. Bring up the second oscillator again. And now bring in some phase distortion. Whoops, that's noise. <laughs> bring in phase distortion.
things are getting interesting. <laughs> bring in, what happens next? Maybe I bring in a low frequency oscillator. Let's see. Of course, it looks great. There's a really great waveform of the display that you cannot see because it's hidden by a map. Um, but anyway. <laughs> school human league before the girls joined setting. The human league were brilliant before the girls joined. So I'm not, I can't just do, if I could play you a rich eight note chord, if I had any musical ability I would, but I'll just play you eight arbitrary notes and say, well. <laughs> synthesizer there's absolutely no doubt it's a synthesizer what's really interesting may not sound much to you guys right but it was a nightmare to get enough performance out of this thing the Raspberry Pi is slow um, I don't even know if it's got any secondary cache at all it's a very very slow processor uh, for the longest time I thought I was gonna have to back off to either monophonic or four note four notes polyphonic um, mercifully the up the turbo mode that Evan announced a couple of weeks ago Save my bacon. So uh, I can now do eight notes with all the features turned on. It's on, honestly, it's not as reliable as one would like it to be in terms of delivery of audio. So the Alsa, um, the talking boat, if you remember, there, was comments, there were comments about Alsa uh, not being all it could be on the Raspberry Pi. Alsa consumes about 50% of my CPU pretty much all the time. Uh, and it's an abstraction to a five foot, right? So Alsa takes bytes that you give it and puts them onto a hardware FIFO. How can it consume that much of the CPU? But it just does. Or rather, it just does under the difficult circumstances when you load things down, it will just decide to take a lot of your CPU. So you have to try and keep the CPU usage on this thing down to about 50%, otherwise it will just delete and launch and go horrible. Um, what else can I say? There was another point I was going to make, but anyway, we'll ignore that. So. I didn't realize the screen had gone blank because I was bleeping and squelching. I do have a couple more slides, but I'll just talk through. So, um, roadmap. So right now, this thing can do uh, eight notes polyphony um, with face distortion turned on with a, a hugely aggressive amount of anti-aliasing code to make sure that it doesn't sound like cack. Um, and with the Mogi fourth order resonant filter turned on. Um, going forwards, I'm actually turning this thing, and I'm talking to Martin Ware from the old Human League. This is why I said Martin, Human League were better when, before the girls joined, because these guys answer the phone when you call them. So he's still in Heaven 17, he's still touring. I'm talking to him, uh, and also he's like a legend, so it's, it's like such an honor to be on the phone with the guy, honestly. Um, talking to him about doing something, not sure what. Um, and the thing I really want to put together almost in his honor, is uh, a complete early 80s, late 70s synth pop workstation with um, a rhythm machine. I've already got the samples in place. As I said, I've got the sampling code in place. So a rhythm machine, 
four sample playback monophonic synths kicking simultaneously, and four of the piano, uh, piano, 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 monophonic synths kicking simultaneously. So a big uh, eight note polyphony spread over um, two different styles of synthesizer um, with completely arbitrary settings on each of the synths. So you could have a, you know, a bass sample, uh, a choir sample, brass, uh, four completely different piano synth settings. Um, and Lindrum and sampled uh, analog, classic old school analog drum machine samples. So that's what I'm working on right now in my copious spare time. Um, and I'll then turn it into an app. The real challenge, so here's, I don't, I don't know anybody in the room has an answer to this. How do you make money out of Raspberry Pi software? It's, it's a challenge. I can see how to make money out of hardware, and Adafruit are doing a great job, but without any IP protection in place, it's really hard to know how to make money out of software. So the only, the only approach I've got uh, that I'm considering is effectively shipping this thing as a complete hardware unit and incorporating a dongle into it, which is really, really evil. Um, and also, it's really evil, and it will be, it'll be hacked in a second, right? Because like, hackers can hack anything in a second. But at least there's a barrier, right? At least you've tried. Um, but if anybody's got any smart ideas how to make money out of Raspberry Pi software, contact me. Um, in the meantime, it will find its way into an app, um, and I'm definitely doing this as hardware. I uh, just don't know, don't know quite when and quite how much it will cost. There are obviously upper limits to how much it will cost, because the Raspberry Pi is quite visibly only $30 worth of hardware, so you can't charge 300 for it. <laughs> 300 quid for it. <laughs> anyway, yeah, done. Questions? Hi there, do we have any uh, questions? One quick note, uh, Friska is going to shut in about uh, 90 seconds. So if anybody wants anything, quick, over there and get yourself something. I can answer questions with my mouth full, don't worry. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions while I'll speak? If not, we have a little bit of, we have some time. Um, please go and look in the demonstration room. We have at least uh, two Raspberry Pi's demos there. There's a couple more on the table here. Thank you all for coming. Thank you everyone who's been involved. Uh, Phil, Friska, anyone else who's off to given up their time to make it happen. Please network, go and find out what's going on. Um, ask people, hear what you're doing, come up with some great ideas.